Today is Thursday, June the 16th, and it's Christian's favorite day of the year. <laughs> budget Adoption Day. Today's Budget Adoption Day is going to be a hybrid board meeting. Some presenters and guests will appear in person, and some will appear virtually. For those who are presenting virtually, please remember to mute your mic when you're not speaking, and before you present, make sure that your mic is unmuted and your camera is on. There are no items on the consent agenda today. Marina? Uh, opportunity for public comment on non-agenda matters. This is the time for the board to hear public testimony, not for board deliberation. We have three people signed up to speak today. Right. Um, injured and pissed off. And uh, Charles Cray uh, Bridge Crane Johnson and Lightning Super Karma. Please come forward. Yes, my name's injured and pissed off and has been since February 3rd of 2017. I had my name legally changed at the old McNoma County Courthouse. And at the time, I did some research on Google and they had more than a million links. So I spell to injured and pissed off. I spell my name, the last name, pissed off is all one word. Uh, if you use quotation marks uh, on Google, you can actually see what applies to me. Uh, it, quotation marks at the beginning and at the end, uh, there and particularly in the image section. There's also videos there. Uh, but I came here, I'm supposed to be the only one in the country that's injured and pissed off and I'm injured and pissed off 24 hours a day and everywhere I go I'm injured and pissed off. So I'll be six next year uh, in injured and pissed off years and just to prevent anything further being misunderstood I was the other day passing the new McNomah County Courthouse along the river and I was walking on the west side of the building of the street uh, there's some kind of a uh, police garage or something there uh, and I thought that that was pretty weird but the reason why I'm talking here is that I couldn't believe I should have taken pictures uh, of the incident but uh, there was a fuel truck that was stopped in the center of the street I'd say that it had to have been closer than 20 feet uh, from the new McNoma County building and what they were doing was they had a gasoline hose down in the center of the sidewalk to where you had to even walk around the hose no signs about fuel dumping and it was like high noon and I should have taken a couple pictures what kind of a courthouse or how long do you expect that courthouse to last with a fuel truck parked out in the middle of the street dumping fuel I mean Timothy McVeigh would jump all over that I wonder if Homeland Security even knows about that they shouldn't be dumping parking a, a fuel tanker like that in downtown Portland at any time but they do i just wondering how long that'll last. And of course, uh, Dr. Fauci, the June 2nd, I was saying happy COVID. Uh, I believe it was the 2nd or the 9th. And he's come down with that now. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, happy budget day, uh, budget adoption day. Uh, if it's budget adoption day, who are the birth parents for the budget? So uh, I'm Charles Bridge Crane Johnson Simka, and uh, unfortunately, I took the roundabout way to get here via the Green Max and the uh, 1962 John F. Kennedy Post Office, which of course is just a block from the Gladys McCoy Health Department building. And uh, as I'm sure you're somewhat tragically aware, um, across from the Gladys McCoy 
Health Department building, one of the subcontractors for JOHS has said, we can't do our job, there's um, um, safety problems. And so those expensive uh, but cost-effective pallet structures that we sometimes call tiny homes, those garden sheds that we air condition for people to live in, uh, some of them look vacant, some of them still seem to be occupied, but um, now that we've gotten through the budget process, a little auxiliary thing that we need to really look, how do we get teeth and accountability into subcontracting from JOHS? You know, it's been tragically in the news about the location where there was veterans housing and how much cost is incurred by management problems when we thought we were giving veterans safe, healthy housing and auditors tell us no, that didn't happen, 800,000 or more dollars gone. And a tiny home village with a sub managed through a subcontractor of a subcontractor. And those people um, are our responsibility. They need to not be displaced. We need to find a way to keep the ones that want to be in that location, safely housed in that location. And um, I saw Art Rios and Jeff Woodward in that neighborhood last week and uh, this idea that we can have somebody living safely in the old Greyhound bus station but not across the street next to the health department. Uh, I hope to hear some public clarity soon, especially for those people who must be extremely stressed out living in sheds and not knowing where their future housing is gonna be. And really, they're just two blocks from the old Westwind apartment where a big fancy federal relocation happened. So I'm probably gonna go by to, to talk to those people and let them know that what works is legal action. They need to band together and recognize that the funding stream came through this board to, and the city to the JOHS and that they should sit tight go down to the lovely new courthouse mentioned and inform that they have inf inf uh, pauperous filing rights and fight you if you can't help them without them going to that level. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Lightning Super Karma. Joe Biden has begun to have a downturn on the commercial real estate market. I used to sell apartment buildings and that's why I own the marina up on Marine Drive till your unconstitutional sheriffs decide to remove me any means necessary. And that's why they'll have body cameras on them and monitored around the clock, like you can't even begin to imagine. But getting back to the commercial real estate issue, as I stated, when the commercial real estate begins to dip, the dominoes will begin to fall. Joe Biden is an absolute joke when it comes to the economy. Joe Biden is an absolute joke when it comes to taking care of the people in the United States. Joe Biden is an absolute joke. And the people will realize that in the next 60 to 90 days when the commercial real estate market begins to unravel, everything falls around it. The banks, other countries, everything. Get ready for the Joe Biden crash fall. It's not gonna be a soft landing like the people think it's going to be. You've never seen anything like it what's on its way. And trust me, you can all thank Joe Biden for that. Issue number two, on that uh, old town shelter, Deborah Kafori's pilot project on how to run a shelter properly, we need to have an audit on that. I recommend having Mary Caballero. She's one of the most professional auditors I know. She knows me quite well. I went in and reviewed every audit they ever did. And I'm asking her to do the audit because as you know, Prosper Portland owns the land and Multnomah County is nothing but a tenant. 
And the reality is you ran that property terribly. I think it's almost criminal. I want to know exactly where those shootings took place. I want to know who died of fentanyl. I want to know everything that went on at that property. You ran it terribly. You're going to be held responsible for running it terribly. And I'm going to ask that you never run another shelter again in the history of Multnomah County. If you have to be removed by the sheriffs of Multnomah County, I will ask them to do that at the appropriate time. Until we get that audit, and we understand exactly why you mistreated those people at that facility. And now you're saying that, oh, it's the gunfire outside the facility. Oh, it's the fentanyl outside the facility. So let's just do a mass eviction. Well, guess what? You do a mass eviction here, what you're saying is that ever there's gunfire, you evict everybody around there and in those buildings. Thanks for your comment. You're the Multnomah County Health Department. Your time. Mental health issues, you drug coming. addiction issues, know what your job. Slum, la slum landlords don't survive in this city. You've been shut down by lightning. Do not operate shelters until we have proper authorities. If you do not do an audit, I will have the law enforcement authorities come in and remove you. And if who's ever touching me, tell them never to put their hands on me again. Do not put your hands on me. That is assault. You all witnessed that. Do not ever put your hands on me Marina, again. Marina, will you please cut his mic? On my own. Thank you. Cut his mic, please. Thank you. Don't ever put your hands on somebody. Ever. I will never talk to Arla. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner uh, Jayapal seconds. Approval of one, R1. And just um, so that we're clear on when people are giving their comments, it's at the end of this um, budget item here. So, thank you. Good morning, Christian Elkin, world famous, number one budget director in the entire <coughs> world. Used to be the state, and then it was the country, and now is the world. But you just told me that I could do anything I wanted to. So I can make them up. Is my, oh, there we go. Thank you, Marina. Uh, so again, for the record, Christian Elkin, budget director, I she, her pronouns. Um, before, you have before you a resolution with three attachments and two sections within attachment A to adopt the fiscal year 2023 budget. Adopting the budget sets the upper limit on departmental spending during the year the board may incorporate amendments that decrease the budget by any amount or increase any fund up to 10%. Our adoption process is a bit complicated and there are a few more steps than a normal resolution for good reason. We've designed the process so that a commissioner has the ability to vote no on an individual amendment, program offer or budget note and still vote yes to adopt the budget. It also allows a commissioner to recuse themselves from voting on a specific item if there's a conflict of interest which has occurred in the past. To accommodate this, I will be asking you to vote on each amendment separately, and I will also ask you if you would like to pull out any item for separate consideration. I will be walking you through each step and vote, and Jenny is with us to make sure that we don't miss anything. So the first attachment is section one, board amendments. It's attachment A1, and it has two sections. The first section, the board amendments, you'll see in the blue and gray columns, that reflects the amendments proposed by the board through Tuesday's work session. The purple and green columns to the right reflect staff's recommended package of amendments and adjustments for approval. Can you, can you hold for a second? Yeah. Okay. Sure. There are we have them. We have a copy here if you need a copy, Commissioner. You sure? Thank you. Please continue. 
So the purple and green columns reflect staff's recommended package of amendments and adjustments for approval. It is intended to reflect and balance each commissioner's priorities with the additional resources available. At this time, the staff recommended a package that is not balanced. And as you know, that's my theme for the year is a balanced budget. Uh, there's an outstanding balance of $270,000 in the American Rescue Plan funding. In order to balance the staff recommended package, we will need to reduce expenditures by $270,000 or find additional revenue to cover those expenses. Christian? Yes, Chair? I need my budget cape. Um, I would like to propose a new budget amendment to ensure that the staff recommended package is balanced and I would like to reduce program offer 10090, which is ARP client assistance. I'd like to reduce that program offer by $270,000 and make that funding available for the staff recommended package. Thank you, Chair. Um, with that, I would suggest approving attachment A1 board amendments with the recommended staff a package in its entirety with the inclusion of the chair's proposed budget amendment to reduce program offer 10090 by $270,000, unless the board would like to pull out any additional items for consideration. We would need a motion and a second. So, so moved. Second. Commissioner Jaya Paul moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. The adoption of attachment A board amendments. Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. Attachment A, Section 1 Board Amendments are adopted. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Attachment A2, which is the Department Amendments. The department amendments include technical, staff, revenue, and program amendments that were reviewed with the board on June 8th and then revised with one addition from the health department to add nearly $2 million for behavioral health crisis services from the state of Oregon Health Authority funding. I would suggest you vote on these as a group and we would need again a motion and a second to approve. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega-Peterson moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds approval of Department Amendments, Attachment A, Section 2. The board clerk will now take a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. Attachment A, Section 2, Department Amendments are approved. Um, we are moving along to our next attachment, which is attachment C. These are the board budget notes. Currently, we have five budget notes. The first is from the chair detailing out a policy process for considering implementation of body-worn cameras for the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office, along with- uh, I'm sorry, Christian. Did we skip over attachment B, 2023? We did, the most important part. Thank you. I just moved right through it. Thank well, you. I don't know if your script is back to back, on, like mine is, but. No, I don't, no, I don't have no, that no. as an excuse. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, so yes, fiscal year 2023 appropriation schedule, attachment B. This schedule authorizes the spending limit by department by fund. The numbers in this schedule reflect the approved budget. We will update this schedule to incorporate attachments A1 and A2 as approved by this board. We would need a motion and a second to approve attachment B, the appropriation schedule, as amended by attachment A. So moved. Second. Commissioner Jayapal moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of attachment B, appropriation schedule, as amended by attachment A. The board clerk will now take a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The attachment B appropriation schedule as amended by attachment A is approved. Now we have budget notes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, currently in your package, you have attachment C budget notes with five budget notes. Again, the first one was proposed by the chair to detail out uh, $500,000 in contingency and the, process, the policy process for considering implementation of body-worn cameras for the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office. 
The second budget note is from Commissioner Stegman requesting a briefing from the Joint Office of Homeless Services and their partners to provide a comprehensive summary of East County investments across housing and the homeless continuum. The third budget notice from Commissioner Vega Peterson requesting a briefing on countywide recruitment and retention efforts and including a review of open vacancies across the county. The fourth note is also for, from Commissioner Vega Peterson requesting an update from our public safety partners on the county's gun violence efforts. And our fifth budget note is from Commissioner Myron asking for a briefing and update on the joint office system metrics and outcomes. We're going to take a quick recess. Um, we've received some last minute um, budget notes that I have not had a chance to review, so we're going to pause um, our meeting for about five minutes while I uh, consult with um, my team about the process for adoption of these budget notes. So with that, we're going to take a five minute recess. Um, so I would like a motion on the proposed budget notes. So moved. Second. Commissioner Myron moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds. Approval of budget notes, attachment C. Marina, please take a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. Budget notes, attachment C have been approved. And now if there are any additional budget notes that we, people would like to be considered, we will vote on them as um, they come up. So please um, bring them forward at this time. I would like to propose uh, two budget notes. And we're gonna take them one at a time, please. Oh, sorry. Okay. okay. I would like to propose the first, a budget note um, uh, regarding uh, integrated Clinical Services Student Health Center follow-up. And uh, this relates to Multnomah County's network of uh, school-based health centers, which are so uh, crucial in providing services to kids in schools. Uh, the intersection of governance and funding uh, is complex between the federally qualified health centers, student health centers, and uh, the Board of County Commissioners. And a significant change in the staffing model for student health centers uh, is being undertaken in fiscal year 2023. Uh, in terms of this change, uh, I would like this budget note will enable the board to consider uh, progress in the change, how the change was made, understand the basis for that, 
um, and understand the impacts in staffing for uh, the school, the new staffing model for school-based health centers. And the budget note reads, uh, the Integrated Clinical Services Division of the Health Department will present a comprehensive briefing on the staffing model for student health centers, including uh, number one, best practices for staffing of student health centers uh, based on the prevalence and types of conditions students his historically present with at the centers. Number two, uh, the uh, history of and changes in staffing models for student health centers, say over the past five years. Number three, the rationale for the current change in staffing. Uh, number four, the cost of the adopted model versus the previous model. And number five, uh, innovative models um, that have been implemented across the country, including the potential for leveraging telemedicine. Um, that is the budget note. Uh, do we have uh, board comments on this budget note? Commissioner Jaipal? No. Commissioner Maggie Peterson? No. Commissioner Stegman, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I guess uh, for me, I, this is a little problematic for me. I apologize, I am sick with COVID. Uh, so I haven't had time to thoroughly uh, process uh, what's been presented. And I guess I'm just wondering, uh, is there another avenue for us uh, to get this information uh, without it being a budget note? Or yeah, a budget note. Um, I'll answer that question unless Christian would like to jump in. Yes, there is. There's always um, additional avenues for consideration. Um, we do have this before us at this time. Okay, thank you. Jenny, did I need to um, have a motion in a second before we talk about these individually? Well, the, um, the commissioner would put forward the motion herself and then someone else would second it. So we can, um, I know that there are several and so we're gonna just, we'll work through the process together. Um, and I would defer to the chair as a presiding officer to decide if you want to hear about each one of them before having the motion process or if you want to do them one by one. And you know there's a saying that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but I'm here to say yes you can. All right, um, may I have a second on Commissioner Myron's motion before we take a vote? Second. Commissioner Jayapal second. Commissioner Myron's motion for an amendment Budget note to attachment C. Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? No. Commissioner Stegman? No. Chair Kafori? No. The budget note does not pass. Next. Uh, I have a second budget note to consider uh, that uh, this regards behavioral health emergency coordination network update. Uh, about 19 months ago, the effort was launched by the city of Portland to create a replacement for the sobering center that had closed due to safety concerns. Uh, the process included um, health, public safety, criminal justice systems, and other community partners in a collaborative effort to not only replace the sobering center, but create a system that would fill a crucial gap in our community's continuum of care for people with unstable behavioral health crises, particularly intoxication. Uh, the network was planned to expand in a phased approach, starting with triage, stabilization, and sobering for people with acute intoxication, but ultimately include withdrawal management a stabilization center and peer-driven services and connections to placement in residential treatment and or supportive housing, including potentially the Behavioral Health Resource Center. Uh, the county um, did not initially formally engage in that process, uh, but subsequently joined, and there has been some confusion regarding the scope, governance, and decision-making. 
in the current budget, the board is investing $300,000 in directing the process. And the city and county have entered into an MOU regor regarding authority over that um, process direction. And uh, the timing, goal, funding, location, and plan uh, are somewhat unclear. And the board has not yet been informed about uh, the process and status of the beacon, um, the beacon model. And so uh, in investing the $300,000, uh, the board would benefit from understanding the history of the project where we currently stand. So the note itself is um, asking that the director's office of the health department present a comprehensive briefing to the Board of County Commissioners on the history, purpose, goals, investments, and status to date of the Beacon Project, uh, no later than fall 2022. Is there a second on this amendment? Second. Commissioner Myron moves budget, a budget note. Uh, Commissioner Jayapal seconds it, and now we have uh, time for questions or comments. Does anybody? Commissioner Jayapal, questions or comments? Commissioner Vega-Peterson? I do, thank you, Chair. Um, so I support the underlying investment of the $300,000 um, for the county on this project, and I, and I think that there it would be a good idea to have a briefing at some point on this, but I don't agree with the characterization of the um, county's involvement in this project, so I'll be voting no on this. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman, I'm very sorry that you are not with us and that you were sick this morning. <laughs> I heard it's breaking for you. Do you have a comment on this or question? Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, and uh, I appreciate the concerns that uh, Commissioner Myron has brought forth, but uh, <laughs> frankly, I don't have uh, all of my mental capacity <laughs> in, in full swing right now. And so this is a lot for me to process, but even if I was at 100%, um, just receiving this in such short notice uh, hasn't allowed me, you know, the appropriate time uh, to really research, um, you know, all of the factors here. And I believe that we can still uh, get the information that Commissioner Myron is requesting uh, through other avenues. So I will be voting no. Thank you. Um, Commission Commissioner Jayapal is first. Thank you, Chair. Um, just what a question, the underlying budget note is the request for the briefing, is that correct? Correct. Um, I'll be voting basing, based on the underlying budget note and not on the characterization that preceded it. Thank you. Commissioner Myron, did you have a comment? Um, yes, thank you. I uh, would love to um, understand what the characterization was that was not um, agreed with, but that does not have to happen here. Uh, the underlying amendment is simply requesting, or note, is requesting the briefing to the Board of County Commissioners on the history, purpose, goals, investments, and status to date of the project. Uh, it does not involve a characterization. Uh, it is requesting information on a direct investment. So uh, I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to respond to Commissioner Myron's proposed budget note. Um, I just want to state for the record that there is no confusion about where we are in the process. The City of Portland led the planning and research phase of the project through their consultant loans consulting. County staff were involved in several work groups and subcommittees. While that phase of the work is now wrapping up, we are moving towards planning for implementation, which the county, I'm happy to say, is co-leading this very important work. The scope Roles and responsibilities are defined in the memorandum of understanding that has been executed between my office and the city of Portland. A project charter is being developed at the request of my office and of the city. And um, if this budget note does not pass today, I want to um, just assure everyone that the health department and my office will stand ready to provide an update for any office or for the board as a whole um, if that is. Um, needed and wanted. Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? No. Commissioner Stegman? No. Chair Kafori? No. The budget note does not pass.
Does anybody else have any budget notes that they would like to bring forward at this time? I do, Chair, thank you. I have two budget notes to propose. Um, these were circulated last night and are responsive to suggestions made over the course of the past couple of weeks, as well as to changes made in my proposed amendments um, over the past couple of days. As I mentioned, they were circulated last night and edits that incorporated suggestions were circulated this morning. The first budget note is for an evaluation and briefing on the Multnomah uh, Access Attorney Program, or MAP, pilot. A pilot of the MCDA Access Attorney Program will begin in fiscal year 2023 to improve public safety by focusing on two specific geographic areas. Each Access DDA will work with local community members, stakeholders, and law enforcement to identify the issues and priorities of their particular area and to problem solve, identify preventive strategies, and prosecute cases specific to that area. The budget note requests that the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office produce a briefing and evaluation of the pilot by April of fiscal year 2023. Metrics are to include the rationale for choosing the geographic locations and how racial equity and or the voices of historically underserved communities were incorporated, number of contacts with community members, types of community groups engaged, number of resource referrals, number of diversions from prosecution, number of cases prosecuted, types of law violations prosecuted, reported crime in the assigned geographic areas, and number of referrals to the Justice Integrity Unit. All metrics are to be disaggregated by race, ethnicity, housing status, and other relevant demographic information. If available, metrics should be compared to prior year. This briefing and accompanying report is to be presented no later than April 14th, 2023. May I have a second on this uh, proposed budget note? Second. Commissioner Myron seconds. Um, do we have questions or comments, starting with Commissioner Myron? Uh, I do not have any questions or comments. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? I just appreciate Commissioner Jayapal's um, many conversations and the work that we've had on this. Commissioner Stegman? No questions, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Marina, will you please take roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The uh, budget note is adopted. My second bu budget note calls for a report on unmet in-home care needs for older adults with experience of homelessness. Recent research shows that older adults with experiences of homelessness are two times more likely to have cognitive impairments and are two and a half to 10 times more likely to have difficulty with self-care. The Multnomah County 2019 point in time report shows that the population of older adults, people aged 55 and older, squarely including me in it, experiencing homelessness increased by 15% over a two year period. These households will likely need additional support in their homes to address challenges caused by physical and mental impairments to remain successful one place, once placed in housing. Because of how homelessness dispro disproportionately impacts households of color, this population of older adults may be at higher risk of negative housing outcomes such as returns to homelessness from permanent housing. This budget note requests that the Department of County Human Services and the Aging, Disability, and Veterans Services Division with assistance from the Joint Office of Homeless Services as needed, produce a report to the Board of County Commissioners that addresses the following areas. Identify the services needed for old, older adult households as well as the number of older adult households that could potentially be served. Identify common risk factors that older adults, tenants may be at risk of eviction due to unmet in-home care needs recommendations of potential programs to address the issues identified, and options for implementation of resources and approaches for piloting the models. The report is to be presented to the board no later than March 31st, 2023. May I have a second, please? Second. Commissioner Myron seconds the motion of Commissioner Jayapal. Uh, questions or comments from the board? Commissioner Myron? Um, I just uh, am really, uh, excited that there that this is being pursued um, and appreciate Commissioner Jaipal's efforts here because this is such a huge issue. Um, one expert I was talking to in the field said that this is the very thing that keeps her awake at night. Um, it's this is a population we see in the emergency department and so I I'm just grateful. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson? No. Commissioner Stegman? 
No questions or comments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The budget note is approved. Jenny, did you want to jump in now? Sure, thank you, Chair Kafori. Unless there are any other budget notes, I recommend that uh, we put all of the budget notes that were presented separately, and by my count, that's four, into an attachment C1 titled something like budget notes considered separately. And that will be for the record. And Christian, if you can pull that together um, and then we can post it online as well. Thank you, but we don't need an additional vote since we voted on them already. That's correct. They're all voted on separately. This is just for the record. Right. We will do that. Thank you. All right. Well, now we have the budget with amendments. We have the appropriation schedule. And we have several budget notes. So now is the time for, um, you can call it questions or comments, or you can call it the big speech. Now is that time. So, Commissioner Myron. We have a tremendous, res tremendous responsibility um, to ensure that our budget is not only balanced uh, and is fiscally sound, but reflects our values and is responsive to our community. Um, Chair Kafori, I imagine this moment may be bittersweet for you and your team. Uh, I don't uh, know the degree to which people realize how difficult uh, your job is, but there is no doubt that you have given your heart and soul to serve our community, it is reflected in your budget and um, you have led us through good times and challenging times. So thank you and congratulations. Um, there are so many other people who have also contributed to the development of this budget. It is hard to call out. It's kind of at the Academy Awards where you're, you know, you're up there and there's so many people to thank. Um, and I, I hope I don't, leave anyone out but just know appreciation is is just emanating from me for everyone involved in this process but particularly the community budget advisory committees and their hard work the budget office which i just could not ever begin to express um, the profound gratitude that i hold for you and the esteem um, the chair's team uh, all of the policy staff engage here, department directors, county staff, hundreds of community members, uh, and the chiefs of staff in particular who work tirelessly to get us to the finish line and who I'm sure are ready to maybe take a break. So particularly, um, thank you so much to my chief of staff, Cynthia Castro, um, Kim Melton uh, from the chair's office, Sarah Ryan from Commissioner Jayapal's office, Chris Fick from Commissioner Vega Peterson's office, and Rebecca Stavenjord from Commissioner Stegman's office. My voice is totally going even as I speak, so hopefully I'll get through this. Um, throughout the process, uh, I continue to believe in and push for and support funding for services and systems improvement that address some of our most urgent crises facing our community. They continue to be behavioral health, houselessness, public safety, public health, and particularly urgent right now, ensuring meaningful access to the full range of reproductive health care, including the right to safe abortion services. I've also focused on items that improve our systems as a whole, particularly around intersectionality of different departments and sectors, uh, integration and accountability, 
and efforts to proactively address root causes of intergenerational cycles of poverty. This budget, I believe, addresses all of those things. Um, the amendments that I particularly uh, brought forward reflect some of those priorities as well and offer what I believe will be some tangible steps forward. And so I want to thank the community for their input, support, uh, and for helping inform my own proposals. Also my colleagues. Uh, in terms of homelessness, uh, I have continued to push for urgent action and harm reduction for individuals and the community, but particularly individuals living in squalor facing a humanitarian crisis in regard to their health, safety, and well-being. And this is even as we strive to prevent and solve homelessness over the long term. This is that dialectic. It is a both and. Um, I uh, have put in my budget note re something that reflects reporting back to the board and attaining a system that understands through relationship and over time how many people are living outside, the, the reality of that, who they are, what they need, so that we can actually meet those needs in the longer term and for their housing. I appreciate the community of alternative shelter providers and visionaries who have come together to establish a learning collaborative to facilitate the establishment of micro villages and other innovative alternative shelter models throughout our county. I'm glad we're investing in an approach um, through uh, my budget amendment that can more rapidly and effectively, that can harness this enthusiasm, leverage it, and create a system that can more rapidly and effectively provide p places that people can be and want to be, even as they're facing being removed and told where they can't be. Um, my, my initial amendment adds capacity to the joint office to help us establish those best practices for new alternative shelters, create coordination and collabor collaboration across the universe of all shelter providers, and help us understand the impacts of alternative shelters on the lives of the people we serve. This is much needed work. I've also advocated for increased accountability and transparency in our systems in general, and am pleased to have brought forward an amendment that takes a concrete step toward ensuring that um, basically the county is holding to account in, is holding itself to account and engaging in contracting processes uh, to get the services that will best meet the needs of our community. While our con county contracting has improved over the years and been recognized for excellence in technical contracting and procurement, and shout out to Brian Smith and his team, uh, there is still work to be done to improve processes and work towards even greater accountability, consistency, and responsible management of taxpayer dollars. I look forward to working with our chief operating officer, the chair's office, and the Department of County Management to hire a consultant who will help do this kind of assessment and provide recommendations for how we take contracting to the next level. Behavioral health has been a priority for me for as long as I can remember. And so I am so pleased that this budget includes support for the Behavioral Health Resource Center uh, for resources to continue progressing uh, in the Beacon Project, and I will um, engage and follow up with opportunities to get br a briefing and information about that project, um, and to continue my participation, as I've been involved in that since the beginning, um, to get more mental health support for our youth, for funding to implement the Frequent User Systems Engagement, or FUSE, initiative, uh, and actually pilot that, and um, climate justice investments, upstream approaches to curb gun violence, and more. I um, am glad that we are expanding our culturally responsive healthcare services to fund uh, access for the LGBTQIA plus community in clinics that 
um, really are directed toward meeting their needs and that they feel comfortable engaging with. And I really appreciate Commissioner Jayapal for co-sponsoring the budget amendment that will add this funding to the health department budget. In terms of public safety, I've advocated strongly for two community-based district attorney offices to focus on the most violent crimes facing our communities. People cycling through the criminal justice system and the healthcare system most frequently with disproportionate impacts and the approach to community with a commitment to justice, equity, and building trust in the community. Thank you, I just have to call out my policy director, Christina Nieves, who poured truly her heart and soul and so much time and energy into connecting with community, with the DA, and all of those who have provided input, and to Commissioner Jayapal for bringing this amendment forward, and Sarah Ryan, wherever you are, um, uh, for all your work on this as well. Finally, I continue to be horrified that Roe v. Wade is on the precipice of being overturned. While we are fortunate to live in a state that protects abortion rights, there is work we can do to elevate and provide at the local level that will bring access to people who are forced to leave their communities to seek services in places that are truly a sanctuary. This is why I'm proud to have co-sponsored the budget amendment with Commissioner Vega Peterson um, providing for an opportunity to, um, to get these services to the people who need them most. And I look forward to working with community and with our uh, providers to be able to get abortion services to anyone who needs those because reproductive healthcare is healthcare and meaningful access to abortious, abortion and gender affirming care is health care and all deserve the right to health care. So there are too many additional items to mention and, um, and I just want to emphasize that the bottom line is support for this budget as a whole. I deeply appreciate um, everyone who's contributed, and I have saved just Christian Elkin for last because I do want to call out such incredible work that you have done um, and your engagement and what you have followed and how you've put it all together has been remarkable. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, I wish I, I need flowers to give to you, and so um, thank you. I continue, I am confident in our continued collaboration that there is no problem that we can't solve working together with our community. Thank you. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, budget day is always a big day and this one feels especially so, although maybe, maybe if I'm here a long time, every single one will feel especially so. Um, this budget is a budget of opportunity. Although the pandemic is by no means in our rear view mirror, the conditions are very different than they were when we adopted our FY22 budget. In June of 2022, Multnomah County, I'm sorry, 20, FY22 budget in June of 2022, 21, Multnomah County had a first dose vaccination rate of about 69%. Today, we have a first dose rate of 92% and a second dose race rate of 81%. For some time now, children older than five have been eligible to be vaccinated, and just as of today, all children, including those younger than five, can be vaccinated. Boosters are readily available, and antiviral pills can help prevent serious illness. On the economic front, the growth in business income tax revenue created by the bit rate increase led by the chair and adopted in 2020, plus the strong performance of some of our largest businesses, has created a positive revenue forecast for the first time since I've been on the board. These conditions have created the opportunity to create a foundation not only for recovery, but for a more equitable, sustainable recovery. On houselessness, as we move into the second year of supportive housing services measure revenue, we're making significant new investments in emergency shelter, housing placement and retention, supportive housing services and outreach and navigation. 
There is no one strategy that will solve homelessness, and this budget presents a balanced approach across the spectrum of homelessness response. It's almost impossible to pick highlights, but I'll mention the strategic capital fund that will allow us to respond to opportunities to acquire or invest in property for shelter or housing, and a master leasing pilot to recruit additional landlords into our rental pool. Both are examples of current investments that will build future capacity, and this budget contains many of those. And I also want to highlight as particularly important some new investments that address the intersection of homelessness and behavioral health. These include the Behavioral Health Resource Center scheduled to open in the fall, which will provide a one-stop shop for people experiencing homelessness and mental health or addiction issues. New behavioral health focused shelter programs, which will provide shelter and services specifically designed for this population. And new permanent housing programs run by behavioral health service providers. Every Multnomah County resident deserves to live in safety, free from the fear of violence. We continue to experience a tragic escalation in gun violence, and this budget includes long-term strategies to address the root causes and consequences of violence, as well as strategies that can have more immediate impact. Youth employment, as an example, is a proven strategy to combat youth violence, and this budget contains a $1 million expansion of our youth employment and opportunity programs funded by the American Rescue Plan and secured by Senator Dembro. The lack of economic stability is a contributing factor to violence, and a new gun violence interruption pilot program will provide stipends to people at risk of engaging in violence and engage them as credible messengers to prevent gun violence. And the budget also includes additional funding for gun dispossession and for prosecution of crimes involving gun violence. Among the communities most impacted by COVID were our immigrant and refugee communities. The pandemic highlighted the need to strengthen our systems for engaging with and supporting these communities. In FY22, we initiated a study of existing services for immigrants and refugees, and I'm very appreciative of the chairs, including in next year's budget, a new position dedicated to following up on the recommendations from that study. I'm also excited about important county investments on climate and resilience, including a wood stove changeout program, cooling support for severe heat events, and a new climate resilience coordinator to develop policies that will help our residents meet the climate challenges we know we'll continue to face. My amendments this year focused on three areas, core human services infrastructure needs, new strategies to deal with pressing issues, and planning for new work on economic equity for Multnomah County residents. I'll mention three, three of my amendments. First, core human service infrastructure needs. Our work rests on the shoulders of our amazing county employees and the equally amazing frontline employees of our nonprofit partners. We're part of an interdependent ecosystem that includes the nonprofit human services workers who staff our shelters, provide wraparound services to immigrant families, and support our children in schools. But part of that ecosystem is at risk. It's at risk because for too long, our society at large has undervalued this work, performed largely by black, indigenous, and people of color, and by women, and has underpaid its workers. As a result, too many of those frontline workers struggle to find housing themselves and struggle to survive in our county. This is neither equitable nor sustainable. If nonprofits can't hire or retain workers, and if those workers themselves need our services, our residents will not get the quality of services they deserve, and this ecosystem cannot hold together. These issues are exacerbated by today's inflationary economy. But for frontline nonprofit workers, that inflation sits on top of a significant pre-existing wage gap that's now built into the system. This is not just a county issue. It's a city of Portland issue, it's a state issue, it's a federal issue, and it's a philanthropy issue. In fact, over the years, the county has done far more than any other funder to address it. Under the chair's leadership, we have consistently provided more generous, generous cost of living adjustments to our nonprofit partners than have other jurisdictions and funders. The budget included a 4% COLA for next year, and the chair's amendment sets aside another 1% in contingency. These are all ways in which the county has led on trying to provide equity for nonprofit workers. And we also have to address the underlying wage gap. Cost of living adjustments keep the gap from getting worse. They don't bring workers up to a living wage. That's why I greatly appreciate the wage study and support, support for development of long-term global solutions proposed in the chair's budget and all of the work the chair and her office have invested in exploring ways to tackle this complicated issue. This budget has given us the opportunity to make some smaller short-term adjustments as we continue to work on the more long-term global approaches. 
My wage equity adjustment amendment provides a 1% adjustment for our contractors to be applied toward wages. This will not come close to bridging the gap, but it's a signal of our commitment to finding longer term solutions. It highlights the urgency of this issue. And once again, it points the way for other jurisdictions and funders. The two other amendments I'd like to highlight are my amendments reallocating funding in order to pilot the District Attorney's Multnomah Attorney Access Program, or MAP, and to fund one FTE in the Department of County Human Services to begin planning for innovative strategies to create economic empowerment and equity. The MAP program will place a deputy DA at each of two locations in the country with the county, not the country, county, with the objective of creating a community-based approach to public safety. The DAs will engage with community members and partners, problem solve to prevent crime, and address safety needs specific to those geographic areas. This is an opportunity to try a new approach to community safety and to the way that our prosecutors engage with community. And it has support from a wide range of community organizations. Along with these partners, we'll closely monitor the impacts of the program to ensure that it promotes safety, prioritizes connection to services, and does not create disproportionate impact for black, indigenous, and other people of color, people experiencing houselessness, and other marginalized groups. And I'm pleased to be able to support the district attorney's office in this effort. And finally, my amendment for an eco economic equity pilot. As social safety net provider, the bulk of the county's work involves addressing the conditions created by poverty. Over the past few years, we've also begun to add programs that actually lift people out of poverty. These include programs that, pr that remove barriers to economic mobility, provide unrestricted cash assistance, and build assets. The FTE funded by this amendment will develop additional strategies for building economic equity by assessing existing county programs where economic stability is a component, outreach and engagement centering the voices of communities of color, and research of other community models. As I said at the beginning, this budget is a budget of opportunity. None of that opportunity would be possible without the many, many people who've worked to bring it to fruition. Chair, thank you and congratulations on your final budget. It is the culmination of, I think, 13. I could be wrong on the number, 13? Too long. <laughs> <laughs> Too many years to count of exceptional service and leadership to Multnomah County. And it has the potential to be transformational. And thank you also to your team, every single one of them, and particularly Kim Melton, for the extraordinary effort that has gotten us here. Christian Elkin, Jeff Renfro, Eric Ariano, and everyone on your teams, and Christian, thank you for the flowers, and yes, we should have been giving you the flowers, not the other way around. Thank you for the late nights, the patient responses to questions, and the careful stewardship that allows us to be in the sound position we're in, even with the potential of headwinds and uncertainty ahead. You're all amazing. To our department heads and all of your teams, this budget is truly the culmination of a year of work and many years before that. Thank you for creating one that truly reflects our county values, and I hope you can take a bit of a break before you start working on the next one. To my colleagues, thank you always for your partnership, your commitment to the residents of Multnomah County, and for our shared values. And thank you to every member of your team, particularly your chiefs of staff, who, who, who worked so hard to bring us to this point. To my team, Monique Smiley, Jesse Rollins, and Sarah Ryan, thank you so much for your work throughout the year, and particularly to Sarah for your work on this budget. And as always, to our amazing, amazing county employees. As I said before, this work rests on your shoulders. None of it would be possible without you. And it's, I always get choked up at this point, and it's my honor to serve with you. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank you and your staff, especially Kim Melton, um, for all the work that you've done to complete this budget process. And as this is your last budget, I also want to thank you for your leadership in creating budgets over the years that center racial equity, prioritize proven um, programs and investments to combat homelessness, move Multnomah County forward in fighting the climate crisis and transitioning off fossil fuels, and leading the critical work in responding to COVID. We've seen your values actualized in each budget you've presented, and I'm grateful for the ways you've always treated these budget as moral documents. I'd also like to thank the staff of all of my colleagues' offices for their hard works over the last few weeks to get this budget over the finish line, especially the chiefs of staff, who I know do so much work on this. Um, and of course, I wanna thank my own staff as well. Um, 
Olivia Cleveland, Hayden Miller, and Chris Fick for all of their work in um, getting this budget ready, preparing for these hearings, and moving our amendments forward. Um, I'm so proud of this budget as a whole. I think it's something we can all be proud of, which really invest um, the resources that are needed in the most critical areas of our work, including homelessness, behavioral health, gun violence and safety, social services, health, and climate resilience. I'm proud that on the homelessness fronts, the most, most urgent issue facing our community, this budget will nearly double the shelter capacity from before the pandemic to nearly 2,700 shelter beds. It funds congregate shelters, motel shelters, and alternative settings such as villages, providing options for those living on our streets. It will help more than 1,450 people move from homelessness back into housing using case management and rental assistance and provides more than 1,700 units of supportive housing for adults and families facing chronic homelessness. We are investing $15 million to secure new properties that can be used as spaces for shelter, day centers, or treatment, motels, shared housing, and other strategic real property investments. Importantly, it bolsters our data collection and program evaluation tools to make sure that we are supporting programs that actually work. And, we are expand and as we are expanding our shelter system, we are going to need better focus on engaging the community in those areas around new shelters. And that's why I'm proud to have fought for an amendment that will support community outreach and engagement when opening new shelters. We know that there is a very real relationship between homelessness and behavioral health. And this budget votes, uh, devotes $15.5 million to that intersectionality. I know we are all excited about the opening of the Downtown Behavioral Health Resource Center this fall and the investment of permanent supportive housing for up to 50 people experiencing homelessness who have been identified as frequent users of the homeless system, emergency health care, and criminal justice systems. And as mental health support is something that is needed for all in our community, and especially our youth who have undergone so much stress and change over the last three years, I am so glad to see that we are investing in vital mental health services for children and young adults by adding case management to grades 6 through 12 across our school-based health systems. We know that our community is still grappling with a severe gun violence, violence crisis, and a focus of my work over the last years has been under, on understanding how our investments in critical services and opportunities for personal growth and development can reduce gun violence. This budget will pilot a program that I fought for, employing stipends to help people on supervision and or people committing acts of gun violence to build economic stability that steers them away from the feeling that they need to participate in dangerous behaviors. And this budget continues our investment in behavioral health teams that specifically work with families impacted by gun violence. We are also beginning a new pilot program that will co-locate deputy district attorneys with community-based organizations in some of the communities most heavily impacted by serious crimes so that we can explore new models of community safety and enhance trust between communities we serve and our prosecutors. I want to thank Commissioner Jayapal for submitting her amendment for this program and also for her openness ensuring there would be two neighborhoods benefiting from this investment. Importantly, this budget continues our march towards preschool for all. More than 600 children are slated to be enrolled this fall in high quality, culturally responsive, inclusive preschool from 36 providers across 48 locations. This budget increases the number of early childhood mental health consultants who can provide a comp comprehensive continuum of culturally relevant and responsive mental health services to children and their families at Preschool for All sites. It all sets aside resources to support facilities and workforce developments to ensure that we grow our pipeline of early educators and preschool spaces needed to provide universal access. I can't wait for this fall when the first children will be entering classrooms as a result of Preschool for All. In submitting amendments this year, I focused on investments that enhanced our neighborhoods and communities that were particularly struggling over the past two years and helped set Multnomah County along paths to increase safety, health, community connections, and access to democracy. We know that businesses have struggled over the last two years and that reported vandalism in East County cities has increased threefold. That's why we've set aside $100,000 in grant funding for small businesses in East County that have been impacted by vandalism. And we will be enhancing our vector control in areas with severe rat infestations, recognizing how challenging that issue has been for residents and small businesses. 
We will be taking the initial steps necessary to establish a public financing program for Multnomah County elections, similar to the program established by the City of Portland, so that we can ensure that our elections are open to all and not just the wealthy and the privileged. Finally, with the rule, ruling overturning Roe v. Wade expected to come out any day now, our board, and I want to thank Commissioner Myron for her partnership in this, took a clear stance in support of reproductive rights and justice by providing $200,000 to organizations that help ensure access to abortions. Overall, this budget makes responsible and sustainable use of the remaining ARPA dollars we have to invest in our community's ongoing response to COVID-19, as well as other programs that mitigate some of the worst effects of this pandemic, such as food insecurity and it sets aside additional reserves responsibly for a rainy day. Most importantly, it affirms our board's values and priorities and makes worthwhile investments in services that will benefit every corner of our county. I'm incredibly grateful for the many, many people throughout the county who have worked hard to build this budget. I know um, the face of that is often um, Eric and Christian and Jeff, but I know that there are so many people who go into working on this budget and I have gratitude for all of you. Um, I am so grateful for my colleagues, Commissioner Myron, um, Jayapal, and Stegman, for the ways that their focus on strongly moving Multnomah County forward equitably and effectively has shown up in the investments in this budget. And again, I want to thank my staff and the chair staff for, um, and Chair Kafori for all your work. Congratulations to all of us. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. I'm so sorry I could not be there in person to vote on this year's budget. As I mentioned, I'm recovering from COVID, which seems to be a sign of the times that we live in and is a contributing factor to what will be one of the largest budgets we have ever passed. But the good news is this additional one-time only funding from the American Rescue Plan has enabled us to better prepare for the future and build community resilience. $300,000 of which will go to the Crops Farm in Troutdale that is managed by Mudbone Grown. The Crops Farm build out is an extensive effort to build a hub for community access to fresh, culturally appropriate food and for culturally specific training of new farmers with a focus on black and African immigrant farmers. With this additional funding, we will be able to achieve our goals to address the ongoing issue of food insecurity through partnerships with the Health Department's REACH program to increase prescription CSA and institutional food purchases of local, culturally appropriate, organically grown produce. Providing basic needs has always been at the core of the county's mission and ensuring that our community has enough food to eat is paramount, which is why it was also critical to fund $150,000 for food security. This amendment to the Department of County Human Services supports the enhancement of food pantries and food security efforts across the county. This funding will help providers meet those increased needs in our communities. I'm pleased we were able to address some of our current needs, but we must also plan for the future. For the last five years, I've been leading the development of the Vance Project in Gresham, where nearly 90 acres will be redeveloped into a community asset. This collaborative effort will bring family wage jobs, housing, community space, a resilience hub, and a new location for animal services to one of the most low income neighborhoods in Oregon. This $250,000 amendment to the Department of Community Services builds on the work of the master planning process completed earlier this year to define three distinct areas of the property. The park and open space concept, the zoning and comprehensive plan alignment, and infrastructure analysis. These specific areas of work allow us to explore immediate and short-term next steps jurisdictional alignment and identify resources for the future phases of the work on the Vance properties. And to address housing and recovery needs, our budget includes $84,600 for transitional housing with a focus on substance abuse recovery and addiction services. This augments our resources to provide a focus on housing, recovery, workforce development, and stability for residents. 
The pandemic has severely undercut efforts to address substance abuse and relapses, and we have seen significant increases in fentanyl overdoses and deaths. Experts in the mental health field point out that young adults, racial and ethnic minorities, LGBTQ plus community members, and those currently living below the poverty level face greater challenges finding help for their substance abuse issues. It is a systemic vulnerability that has worsened since COVID-19, and I'm pleased we are investing in more opportunities for these individuals. And finally, I want to thank my entire team, Jennifer Lewis, Leanna Mori, and Rebecca Stavanger. One of the things I appreciate most about my team is their willingness to engage in challenging and sometimes unrewarding behind the scenes work while always striving to preserve and maintain the important relationships that we have with our fellow board members, our employees and partners. Our work here is not about individual wins. It is about servant leadership to the communities we serve. That is a commitment my team and I have always prioritized, which has enabled us to lead in a way that I am incredibly proud of. And for that, I am deeply grateful for each of them. It has often been said that our budget is a moral document, and I believe that to be true. And while we have each brought forth individual amendments collectively, the budget reflects this board's values. And I'm grateful and honored to serve with a board who always strives to do the greatest good for the greatest number of our residents. Thank you to my colleagues and their dedicated teams, especially their chiefs of staff who worked so hard to get us to a balanced budget. And to Chair Kafori and her entire team, I want to thank you for leading our county through one of the most difficult and challenging times. And while this is your last budget, your legacy leaves our county in a stronger financial position than ever that will enable critical policies and programs to meet the needs of many. To our employees, managers, directors, and volunteers, as well as our contractors and partners, and especially Christian, Jeff, and Eric and their teams, who will all deliver on the promises that we made today, I thank you. You are the heartbeat of the county, and without you, we simply could not do this important work. Thank you. I'm really glad that you all spoke first so you could say those nice things about me before I give you the very long speech, because it is my last one, as you know. Anyway, good morning. It's still morning while I start talking. Um, the budget before us this morning is my 13th as a member of the board, my eighth as county chair, and yes, it is my very last. While the budgeting process has always been an integral county function, it's never been viewed as a particularly glamorous part of our work. That's why we have to bring the bling. <laughs> As many of you know, budget season brings with it scores of meetings with county departments, hours of discussions, deliberations, and budget work sessions, and so, so many spreadsheets. And while the budgeting process relies on an immense amount of technical thinking and expertise, it is fundamentally so much more than a technical exercise. Budgeting at Multnomah County is an exercise in finding and funding ways to bring to life the values and priorities of our organization and those of the communities we serve. It's an exercise about being realistic about the challenges we are facing, identifying the opportunities that we have, and aspirational about the kind of community we can play a role leading. It's an exercise in putting our commitment to listening and partnering with community into action. In fact, some of the most enduring relationships that I and, and the county at large have formed with community members and organizations were seeded and grown amidst the budget process. Looking back, I've realized that the work of building the county budget, as laborious and painstaking as it can be, distills into one intentional process and one significant product. So many of the reasons that I chose to follow the path of public service. Little did I know, however, that my final three years in this office and my final three budgets would take place under the shadow of a generational public health crisis, 
flanked by several additional acute crises. These trials have stretched our community, exposed and exploited pre-existing disparities, changed the ways we go about our daily lives and brought us waves <laughs> of grief and loss. And yet from the very start of the COVID-19 pandemic, the county led the public health response through education, guidance, testing, and vaccinations. We leaned further into our role as a safety net than we ever have before, offering unprecedented amounts of rent assistance, expanding the reach and breadth of our wraparound services, and increasing our work to prevent and interrupt violence. We preserved our shelter capacity during the most harrowing days of COVID and have made great strides in both growing our shelter system and getting more people into permanent homes faster. Recognizing the magnitude and of even spread of these needs, recognizing that the magnitude and uneven need spread of these needs are driven by racial disparities, we have continued to take steps to dismantle systemic racism, racism and build up equity in our community and in our own organization. And throughout all of this work, I believe that our community has been able to get a clearer picture of the many roles that Multnomah County holds in the lives of our residents, particularly the most vulnerable. The county's 2023 budget maintains those core safety net services that have been so vital for the stability and well-being of our community, while also expanding effective strategies so that we can continue to meet emerging and increasing needs. At the same time, this budget is also built to look beyond the challenges in front of us so that we can continue taking meaningful steps toward becoming the kind of community that every resident deserves. A community that is more equitable and more just, a community where everyone can find healing and opportunities to thrive. We've been able to put resources behind our ambitious plans because we entered the 2023 budget process in the best financial shape that the county has been in for years, which also meant for the first time in my tenure as chair, I did not request any cuts. But to be clear, our budgets aren't created in a vacuum. Multnomah County's 2023 budget builds and improves upon the lessons that we've gained from past budgets, and there have been plenty gained through the seven budgets that I've overseen in order to best meet the needs of our current moment. This budget combines data, clear feedback from our community, and an equity framework with a full appreciation of the opportunities afforded by our hard-earned fiscal health. At just over $3.3 billion, this budget is by far the largest that the Board of County Commissioners has ever adopted. And while I recognize that it might be easy to get hung up on the dollar figure, the significance and promise of this budget are grounded in the thoughtfulness and thoroughness, strategy and system thinking that went into its creation. As we pass through an uncertain recovery, this Multnomah County budget strengthens the safety net, promotes racial justice, and boldly builds infrastructure for a better future. It reflects our belief that we can come together to solve our problems, and it promotes solutions to our greatest challenges, and it lifts up opportunities for people across the county to achieve their full potential. Nowhere is that more apparent than in the investments that the 2023 budget makes into our efforts to combat chronic homelessness and housing instability, as well as deeply related issues like behavioral health. It really wasn't that long ago when the county was responsible for helping homeless families while the city was responsible for helping homeless individuals. So my second budget as chair established the Joint Office of Homeless Services to bring those resources under one roof. As the systemic and structural pressures that caused people to lose their homes in the first place have only grown bigger and stronger over the last decade, so have we. Over the years, we've leveraged the Joint Office budget to build a system to quickly help people surviving outside find their way back into a home, thoughtfully growing our offerings of temporary shelter, case management, support services like addiction and mental health treatment, and long-term rent vouchers. But this budget gives us a transformational opportunity to finally build out the breadth of the solutions that we know work in helping end people's homelessness, including $130 million for shelter and outreach, which includes $53 million in capital, 
$106 million for housing placements, rent assistance, case management, and support services. Each of these investments includes the widest range of services this community has ever seen and are born out of years of research from both our own community and across the nation about what's most effective at ending homelessness. And make no mistake, this is a strategic and surgical expansion of the interventions that we know work, the addition of services that are responsive to emerging needs, and a concerted effort to improve the coordination of all of our efforts. Put together, we are widening the pathways back home for our neighbors surviving outside. And I can tell you that throughout my time serving on this board, one of the things I'm most proud of is following the voices of the people who are closest to the crisis when it comes to our program and budget priorities. These investments represent a turning point for our responsive system, not just because of the amount of funding it includes, but because of who we trust to inform the direction for what our services look like. That principle also applies to the way that the county has responded to the needs of people experiencing both homelessness and severe and persistent behavioral health challenges in downtown Portland. This dedicated resource center will change the trajectory of their lives, will help them recapture the stabilizing effects of housing, improving their health, and giving people a reason to hope. In 2019, we purchased the Bouchong building with the idea to convert it into the Behavioral Health Resource Center. And since then, we've worked closely with people with lived experience of mental health and addiction to help design the BHRC's day center, a behavioral health shelter, and bridge housing. This budget puts us on the path to open the doors this fall to the day center that will be an entry point for people to engage and to build relationships with providers and staff the new behavioral health shelter on the third floor will open in a, a few months later. Over the last two years, I have heard from nearly every corner of this community about the very real ways that the pandemic has taken a toll on the mental health and well being of our students. It's something that I've seen firsthand <coughs> with my own children. So, we're expanding the case management services through our school based mental health program to serve every grade not just kindergarten through third. For decades, Multnomah County, nearby jurisdictions and public safety agencies have worked within the framework of a criminal legal system over-reliant on prosecution and punishment and under-equipped to address behaviors rooted in inequities like poverty and health disparities. Work through our local public safety coordinating council over the decades has, has advanced some really important reforms. But it wasn't until 2020 when the county spearheaded a system-wide commitment to building a vision of a public safety system more oriented towards services, healing, and restoration. This budget supports that effort, known as transforming justice, as it approaches a pivotal stage to turn that commitment into actionable plan to shrink the criminal legal system and expand supportive services and advance racial equity. And while we work to change the public safety system, we are also committed to addressing the conditions that put people at day-to-day -day risk of committing or being harmed by violence. The urgency of that work has become all the more apparent during the pandemic when the dramatic disruptions to stability, connections, routines, and opportunities have resulted in a stunning crisis of community violence. Today, we're working across all of our departments through an incredibly broad but coordinated array of programs, spanning interventions aimed at preventing violence in the first place to those that meet people who are already involved in the criminal legal system to break the cycles of violence. Since we exhausted the county's legal pathways to restrict firearms a decade ago, we have increasingly invested in programs focused upstream to connect community members and families who are at highest risk of committing or being harmed by gun violence, and this year's budget is no exception. These programs are designed to reduce risk factors by helping youth and families build toward a foundation of economic security, health and opportunity, and also to help individuals and households and whole neighborhoods affected by gun violence, helping them find hope and find opportunities and develop resilience. When it comes to interrupting violence, we're investing in new programs that will leverage stipends to help people at a particularly high risk of committing acts of gun violence and help build financial stability, mitigating a driving factor that leads to dangerous behaviors. 
And because our community's gun violence response spans across county departments and divisions, we are investing in a new coordinator in our local public safety coordinating council office to ensure that our efforts remain aligned and provide a critical connection between the county and our external agencies and groups. We know that community and gun violence are complex issues that often transcend jurisdictional boundaries. This budget reflects Multnomah County's commitment to using every lever that we have at our disposal to break cycles of violence, while at the same time fostering healing and hope. Maintaining and expanding county services that support the needs of youth and families, as it has been throughout my entire time as chair, remains a top priority in this budget. Throughout the pandemic, the work of Multnomah County's Bienestar de la Familia program has grown at an incredible pace to keep up with the level of need among families who have experienced disproportionate harm and instability. I've heard from countless families that Bienestar's culturally responsive housing, behavioral health services, food, and other safety net services has been a lifesaver over the last two years. This budget adds three additional staff at Vienna Star so this program can continue to do its best work. We're also strengthening and expanding parts of our domestic violence response system so that we can better engage with, serve, and support our domestic violence survivors. And one of the most exciting things that we're looking forward to with this year's investment is the next stage of the implementation of the Preschool for All program. This year's budget includes funding to welcome our first 677 students this fall into free, high quality, culturally responsive and inclusive preschool. When community members come to the county for help, they should expect and they deserve to be treated compassionately, equitably and with dignity. And as a workplace, Multnomah County must model those same values for our employees. Throughout the history of our organization, that simply always hasn't been the case, especially for our employees of color. For years, the county made earnest but incremental and piecemeal attempts to build a stronger culture and a workforce that better reflects the communities we serve. In 2017, our employees implored, advocated, and demanded that we do more and move more quickly to tear down and transform systems and practices of injustice within our own organization. That reckoning resulted in the Workforce Equity Strategic Plan adopted in 2019 and a series of investments and initiatives to make that plan real and meaningful for our workforce. Since then, we've made unprecedented investments in this work, fully aware that these budget decisions were only the beginning of a sustained commitment and not merely a one-time action. The FY23 budget maintains and in some places increases equity related funding and staffing across our departments. Notable among these investments are funding to bolster the restor restorative processes that co must come alongside the work of our complaints investigation unit. And this budget includes one time investments to launch and review the update of our workforce equity strategic plan by the spring of 2023. I'm proud of and grateful for the progress that we've made with our investments, even amid the pandemic. We've supported equity teams and practitioners across the county, and in fact, every single department now has its own dedicated equity manager. But we must keep pursuing the hard work of becoming an organization that models safety, trust, and belonging for all of our employees and residents. Since the very first days of COVID-19, my goal Really, Multnomah County's goal has been to save lives, and we have worked tirelessly to keep our communities as safe and healthy as possible. But the threats that communicable disease pose have existed long before COVID, and they certainly won't end with COVID either. The experiences and lessons that we've earned throughout the pandemic have only underscored the importance of having a robust public health system, one that can protect us, and responds to communicable diseases in a way that is nimble, equitable, and effective. So while we're continuing to invest in COVID-19 response strategies, Commissioner Stegman knows too well, we're not out of this uh, pandemic yet. We're also using $5 million to add capacity to our efforts to modernize our public health system. 
That means improving our, avail our ability to prevent, track, report, and respond to all communicable diseases and to develop better understanding of the health challenges and risks emerging in our local communities. So this budget supports additional staffing in our environmental health division to research policy actions concerning the ways that climate change, transportation justice, and other environmental and social conditions impact people's health. And because the effectiveness of our public health work is so often and so closely tied to the coalitions and culturally specific partnerships, we're providing funding to continue building them up as well. Our pandemic response has not only reinforced that we cannot and do not do this work alone. The network of community-based organizations that partner with the county are an important part of this community's safety net and provide vital health and human services to our children, our families, and our elders. And we see that our nonprofit contractors are often struggling to provide the wages necessary to hire and retain workers. Finding a lasting solution to the challenge of providing competitive wages for nonprofit human services workers is not simple, but it is necessary. Multnomah County cannot solve this regional and state issue on our own, but we do have an important role to play and that means pursuing both immediate and lasting change. This budget not only makes permanent the base pay increases we implemented for shelter and outreach workers during the height of the pandemic, but it also invests in a wage study that will ultimately offer us a path to pay equity within our critical community programs. The executive budget ensured that our social service contractors would receive a 4% cost of living adjustment this coming fiscal year. And with the support of my board colleagues, this adopted budget goes even further in providing an additional cost of living adjustment and a wage equity adjustment for contracted services. Equitable funding for the services that our community partners provide is critical. And I know that having enough space and sufficient infrastructure is often just as essential as a success to the success of community services and programs. This budget expands, expands on a community capital program that I created last fiscal year. And this year, with the increased funding, we will be able to support the capital expenditures of at least 10 organizations that serve communities who have been most impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And lastly, the extreme weather events that Multnomah County residents have endured over the last years, and especially in the last 12 months, offer a harsh reminder that the dangers of the climate crisis are here now. And they pose a very real threat to the health and safety of our community that is a both immediate and ongoing. The 2023 budget includes new investments that into programs like getting portable air conditioners into 1,000 households and cooling kits to 10,000 people to keep them safe during extreme heat. At the same time, we are investing in policy work that will ease the burdens and risks of climate change on our community. A new climate resistance coordinator in the Office of Sustainability will help us amplify our efforts by advancing programs and policy interventions that can help our community navigate and prepare for the worst effects of climate change. Additionally, this budget ensures frontline community-based organizations can participate in the next phase of our Climate Justice by Design initiative which will lead to Multnomah County's new climate justice plan next spring. <coughs> I sit here today feeling deeply proud. Paul, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> I sit here today feeling deeply proud of Multnomah County's 2023 budget. This budget was built on the profound experiences that we've come through together over the last several years. The collective adversity, resourcefulness, innovation, and creativity, the resilience that we've built and tapped into to endure all of it. But it also reflects an abiding belief in the powerful, critical part that Multnomah County will and must continue to play in shaping our community into one that is stronger and more equitable, safer and more just. In that spirit, I am confident that the 2023 budget equips us <coughs> to respond to the needs that we'll face long past this pandemic and also reveals the many ways that Multnomah County will help our community rise above them. The county's defining role outlasts any single person sitting on this dais, including in this seat. 
but I feel incredibly grateful to have contributed to propelling the work of Multnomah County forward. And I also feel fortunate to have had the privilege of collaborating with this particular board through multiple budget sessions. To Commissioners Sharon Myron, Sushila Jayapal, Jessica Vega-Peterson, and Lori Stegman, thank you for your insightful contributions to this budget that has endured this budget, ensured that this budget document is the most effective and equitable that we could build together. To our budget director, Christian Elkin, our economist, Jeff Renfro, and the entire central budget team, the amazement and gratitude that I feel for your expertise and guidance has reached new depths or new heights every year. Thank you. I also want to extend my thanks to our chief financial officer, Eric Ariano, and our chief operating officer, Serena Cruz, and to my team. You know how grateful I am for each and every one of you, and I'm not going to name off your names because you know I will mispronounce someone's and they will cry. <laughs> and finally, to all of the 6,000 people who make up Multnomah County's workforce, to all of those who I've had the honor of serving alongside through my entire time at the county, thank you from the bottom of my heart. As significant of an achievement it is to adopt the county budget today, <coughs> it is still only a single point. <laughs> I'm not sure I can finish this. Thank you. Done. Now for a vote. <laughs> Now it is the time for the final vote on the amended FY 2023 budget with the three previously adopted attachments. Marina, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair. I mean, we did. <laughs> Over the time of our budget, we received a lot. Not at this moment. Excuse me, Chair, a yeah. matter of process? Yes. Um, can we have a motion and a second? No, I'm sorry, we don't have to do that today. <laughs> Um, may I have a motion on the final adoption of our budget with the amended attachments? So moved. Second. Commissioner Jayapal moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of the adopt, uh, to adopt the budget with our amended attachments. All right. I'm going to call on commissioners by district to see if you have any final budget questions, and we'll start with District 1. No questions. Thanks. Commissioner Jayapal? No questions. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? No questions. Commissioner Stegman? No questions. All right, Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The resolution is adopted. I know I promised some people that I would do the wobble upon our adoption, but I've decided that in order to maintain my integrity for the rest of my term as county chair, I will not be doing that today, <laughs> possibly New Year's Eve. All right, R2. Chair, if I can take one moment, I normally don't do this, but this is a um, special day and a bittersweet day for us, so I also, there's no crying in budget, except for I think there's a lot of crying in budget, to be honest with you. So I'm gonna get through this, but um, Chair Kafori, this has been an incredible journey. You've been a champion of the county's programs and people. Whether you were overseeing significant budget increases or navigating cuts needed to keep the most essential programs going. Even today, with the biggest budget the county has ever seen, the need in our community is still greater than our resources. Yet you've worked tirelessly to listen to all the information, balance competing priorities, dig into the details, work with the community departments and the commissioners to find the most workable solutions. This is something you've done every year you've overseen the budget. While maintaining a steadfast devotion to an equitable process that focuses on the people we serve, whether they're our clients, our employees, or the broader community. 
Since I became budget director, we have spent a lot of time together <laughs> in meetings on weekends, in so many budget work sessions, on budget walks. Um, we've been talking about decimal dust and baby millions, and I'm going to miss your wry sense of humor, your keen ability to hone in on the key questions, your endless willingness to nerd out with me on the math, almost endless until we get to those spreadsheets and then she just lets me have them. <laughs> it's been an honor to work with you over the years and I consider it my great privilege to be your budget director for this year's final Multnomah County budget. To show you how much you've meant to me and to all of us in the budget office and the Department of County Management, we have a small award for you. We hope that when you look at this in the future, it will remind you of all the wonderful accomplishments during your time at the county. Every time I look at one of those beautiful budgets, some of them are sparkly, I will think about everything that you've done for our community. Thank you from the budget office. So, are we gonna hug? I get to bring it to you. <laughs> There's no hugging and buzzing either. Now, now, what can, how can you beat that? What comes next? Oh wait, R2. <laughs> R2, resolution levying ad uh, valorem property taxes for Multnomah County, Oregon for fiscal year 2023. So moved. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves, Commissioner Myron seconds, approval of R2. Oh wait, now we've gotta find the money to pay for that budget. Oh, welcome, Chris. This is a very important step. <laughs> Thanks for everybody for keeping me in line so we won't just skip from A to C. Uh, this is the next step in adopting the fiscal year 2023 budget. The adopted budget provides for ad valorem property taxes to be levied on all property. The action authorizes rate levies for the general fund of $4.34 for every $1,000 of assessed value and 0 0.05 cents of every $1,000 of assessed value for the historical local option levy, which are unchanged from last year. There's also an additional authorization for a general obligation bond debt levy of $54.9 million for the second year of debt service for the library bond approved by the voters in November of 2020. And as a reminder, general obligation bonds are not subject to Oregon's constitutional limits on annual property tax growth or compression. I'm gonna read the definition. That, that's my cheat sheet. <laughs> or, or also known as Jeff Renfro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, commissioners, uh, questions, comments? Uh, we'll start with this time with Commissioner Stegman. No questions, thank you, Chair. Commissioner Myron? No questions. Commissioner Jayapal? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson? No questions, thank you. Marina, did we get any public comment on this item? No, Madam Chair. All right, will you take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kapori? Aye. The resolution is adopted. R3, resolution adopting the financial and budget policies to be used in fiscal year 2023 and repealing resolution 2021-045. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Approval of R3. Good morning, Chair Kafori, Commissioners. That, that is so hard to follow, but I'll try to be quick. Do you have an award for me too, Eric? Uh, unfortunately, no, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, so the, this uh, request is just to approve the financial and budget policies for fiscal year 2023. As I shared last week, these set the framework for financial and budgetary decision making uh, for the year. Um, they follow best practice from GFOA, Government Financial Office Association, and we have 17 policy statements in the document. There are no changes from what I shared last Wednesday in terms of uh, proposed changes. But I will remind the board of what I did share in terms of proposed changes for this year, and as to adjust the policy statement around one-time only funds. Um, after we fully fund reserves, 50% goes to capitalization or recapitalization of uh, facilities projects. We're just adding and or to include information 
um, technology projects in that component. And then we're making a change to our investment and cash management uh, policy statement that just essentially prohibits um, prepayment for services and purchase of goods. And then, um, but allowing for exceptions if there's an emergency or um, other operational needs that might merit uh, a prepayment for services or purchase of goods. And again, no, no changes from what I shared last week. Um, so any questions or comments? Oops. Marina, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, Commissioner Jayapal, questions or comments? No questions. Thank you. No questions. Thank, thank you. you. Commissioner Stegman? No questions. Commissioner Myron? No questions. Thanks. All right. Marina, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The resolution is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. R4, a resolution adopting the Multnomah County Investment Policy for fiscal year 2023 and repealing resolution 2021-051. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega-Peterson moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds approval of R4. Okay. Welcome for, back. <laughs> for the record, Eric Gardano, Chief Financial Officer. This is a request to approve the investment policy for fiscal year 2023. As I shared last week, we do have a, a, some policy statement around investments in our financial and budget policies, but the state requires that we have a separate investment policy that sets a framework for our investments for Multnomah County. Our guiding principles are around preservation of capital, maintaining strong liquidity, but also maximizing earning potential, and it goes in that order. Um, there's no changes from what I shared last week in terms of changes to the investment policy. Uh, I did share last week that for this year we have one um, change around uh, maturity constraints. Um, our policy currently has that 10% uh, of our portfolio needs to be needs to mature within 30 days. We're extending that to 90 days, and that's because of the infusion of library bond proceeds. So we want to make, be able to maximize earning potential. So we're going to adjust that temporarily while we spend or work through that project. Um, other changes are just cosmetic reference changes, updates, uh, but no other changes. So any questions or comments? Do we receive any public testimony on this item right now? No, Madam Chair. All right. Questions, comments, Commissioner Baker Peterson. No, thank you. Commissioner Stegman. No questions. Thank you. Commissioner Myron. No questions. Commissioner Jayapal. No questions. Thank you, Eric, for keeping your eye on this. You, um, be, it's in no small part due to the great work of you and your team that we are in such good financial sp space here at Multnomah County, so thank you. And Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The resolution is adopted. R5, resolution adopting and defining the various funds to be used in fiscal year 2023 and repealing resolution 2021-075. So moved. moved. Second. Commissioner Jayapal moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Approval of R5. Again, for the record, Eric Gardano, Chief Financial Officer. I promise this is my last one. <laughs> um, now, this resolution uh, adopts the funds where we do our accounting and budgeting for fiscal year 2023. We have governmental funds, um, capital funds, debt service funds, enterprise funds, and custodial funds. Um, we have, I believe this year is about 45 uh, funds that we'll have, excluding custodial funds. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, we're proposing one um, additional fund for this year, 2518, which is a new fund for the Justice Center capital work that will happen, and then we're going to phase out the asset replace or Hanson replacement fund to 512 in fiscal 2023. Um, I will note that um, we usually do this on an annual basis, adopt our funds or we do our accounting and budgeting for the following fiscal year. If there is a change that happens during the year, we will come to you uh, for approval as we cannot expend in the fund without having the board's approval. A good example is that we actually uh, added the FQHC fund this year, and we came to you during the fiscal year to make sure we had the authority to actually spend in that fund. So, Marina, did we receive any public testimony? No, Madam Chair. All right, Commissioners. Commissioner Stegman, do you have any questions or comments? No questions. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Myron? No questions. Commissioner Jayapal? No questions. <coughs> Commissioner Randy Peterson? No questions. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Myron? 
Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The resolution's adopted. Thank you, Chair. Board. Thank you. All right, now we will recess as the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners and convene as the Multnomah County Library District. R6, resolution adopting the fiscal year 2023 budget for the Multnomah County Library District and making appropriations thereunder pursuant to ORS 294.456. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds. Approval of R6. Good morning. Good morning. You know, I was sitting out there and realizing Chair Kafori, I've never referred to you as Madam Chair. So this is my last opportunity. I know, I was feeling a little badly about that. So Madam Chair, um, Commissioners, I'm Vailey Elke, Director of Libraries. I use she, her pronouns. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Um, I am joined by the fabulous Katie Shifley, our new Finance and Facilities Director. So I'm pleased to be bringing before you the FY23 budget proposal for the Multnomah County Library District. We're really glad to be able to say that this past year, all of the library's 19 locations have reopened to the public. Our FY23 budget reflects a continued commitment to serving the needs of those most impacted by the pandemic to, and to centering race and those in our community facing the greatest barriers to reaching their full potential and to adapt our services over the coming years. The district budget will fund current service levels for library operations resulting, resulting in 4.6% growth over the FY22 budget. The budget also reflects an increase in expenditures relative to prior years from the library district capital fund. We're using these resources primarily to augment the amazing work that the bond program is doing to expand and modernize library spaces in order to maximize the public benefit of the bond for Multnomah County residents. As always, I thank you for your leadership, your engagement, and your support, especially this past year. Uh, as I hand it over to uh, Katie, I just want to note that while this is Katie's first time um, doing our budget approval process. It's also your last chair, Kafori, and I just want to um, thank you for being the wonderful chair and boss that you've been for the past eight years. And with that, I'll hand it over to Katie. Thanks, Bailey. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is Katie Shifley, and I'm the Director of Finance and Facilities for the Library System. You have before you a resolution with two attachments to adopt the fiscal year 2023 library district budget. The resolution itself contains the appropriation amount of 119.3 million for the library district and 53.6 million in the library district capital fund. Adopting the budget will set the upper limit on spending during the year. Uh, the board can incorporate amendments to decrease the budget by any amount and increase budgeted funds by up to 10%. Attachments A and B refer to the two revenue amendments that you've already reviewed in an earlier budget session, and you will be voting on a resolution to adopt inclusive of these two attachments. We are happy to answer any questions you may have. Marina, do we receive any public testimony on this? No, Madam Chair. All right, commissioners, questions, comments, starting with Commissioner Myron. Thanks. Commissioner Jayapal. No questions. Welcome, Katie. And just want to appreciate, uh, relating to that last amendment, the work of the Library Foundation to support the libraries. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Uh, it's great to see both of you. Um, no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like we just had all this pomp and circumstance. For, and, <laughs> I know that was so fast. Uh, <laughs> Should we just sit with this a little bit longer? I mean, we all, you know how much we love the library and you deserve a little bit more than just a pass. Well, I did wear a dress for you today. Uh, <laughs> I know it's, it's a many, many, day of many firsts along with many lasts. So um, Katie, don't, you don't have to call me Madam Chair, but it is really wonderful to, to see you in front of us. And I did notice that you um, can rattle off your title very quickly for someone who's just started in it is rather long, so congratulations. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> All right, how about a vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye, the resolution's adopted. 
R7, Resolution Adopting Financial and Budget Policies for the Multnomah County Library District for Fiscal Year 2023 and Repealing Resolution 2021-047. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega-Peterson moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Approval of R8. Uh, for the record, Katie Shafley, Finance and Facilities Director for the Library. Uh, the Budget Office and Library District recommend approval of this resolution adopting the Library District's financial and budget policies for fiscal year 2023. Um, these policies are in, in alignment with the county's uh, financial and budget policies, which you just heard about from Eric, and among other things, lay out the district's policy to maintain an unappropriated reserve equal to 10% of estimated property tax revenues for the year, as well as a $500,000 contingency. Marina, did we receive any public testimony on this? No, Madam Chair. All right, commissioners, questions, comments? Commissioner Chaipal. No questions, thank you. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Stegman. Uh, no questions, but I guess I did, did. I we missed the opportunity to thank the library. Is this? Can I go back? We you can thank uh, them now. We also have one more, which is about levying the ad valorem property taxes. But you can thank people right now if you'd like. <laughs> it's good. Okay. Good uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm a little bit out of it. Uh, but thank you, uh, Bailey and Katie, and your entire team for bringing forth uh, this year's library budget. Our libraries are a beacon of light for communities and you know not only do they provide books, materials, and creativity, but they also provide refuge for some of our most vulnerable residents. And all of that is only possible because of our dedicated staff. Thank you to all of you who work so hard to deliver such important services to our community. And I'm so excited for the future of our library system and so grateful for Bailey's leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Myron. Um, what Lori Stegman said. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. All right, Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Jayapal. Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Stegman. Aye. Chair Kafori. Aye. The resolution is adopted. R8, resolution adopting and defining the funds to be used in fiscal year 2023. Nope. Oh. We're on nine. We just did eight. That was seven. That was? That was? Seven. Yeah. No, we're on eight. Oh. There's so many of these. <laughs> uh, defining the funds to be used in fiscal year 2023 and repealing resolution 2021-049. So, Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Myron seconds approval of R8. The Budget Office and Multnomah County Library District Budget Officer and Director uh, recommend approval of this resolution uh, to adopt and define the general fund and the capital fund for the library district. Any public testimony, Marina? No, Madam Chair. Does anybody have questions or comments? All right, we'll have a vote. Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Jayapal. Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Stegman. Aye. Chair Kafori. Aye, the resolution is adopted. R9, resolution levying ad valorem property taxes for the Multnomah County Library District, Oregon for fiscal year 2023. So moved. Second. Commissioner Myron moves. Commissioner Vega-Peterson seconds. Approval of R9. So as for the county, this is the next and final step in the adoption of the fiscal year 2023 library district budget. The adopted budget provides for an ad valorem property taxes to be levied on all property. Uh, this action authorizes the district rate at $1.22 uh, $1 per $1,000 of assessed value, which is below the voter approved maximum rate of $1.24. And as you will recall, the general obligation levy for the library bond was part of the county's resolution presented just a bit earlier. Marina, any public comment? No, Madam Chair. Questions or comments from our board? Um, there's a long honored tradition at Multnomah County of asking the <laughs> library staff who come forward to present at the end of their presentation what good books you're reading. So, Ooh, uh, okay. yeah, or have read. You can pick anything. I just started a book last night called The Fledgling, which I, it's about vampires, and I, <laughs> it's very good, and I've gotten into it so far. I'm about 100 pages in, so that's what I'm doing right now. Thank you. I'm so glad she said that because you guys mix. always talk about these very highly intellectual books when you yeah, talk about them and that's like more my speed. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Vampires, excellent. Bailey? 
How about you? Um, well, I, in keeping with what Commissioner Vega Peterson just said, I just started listening to a ton of French book. Um, from a recommendation from the chair. I've never read any of her books, and she's perfect for audio. But I did want to mention, and this is a little bit of, um, if you'll indulge me, um, just a little bit I want to say about the chair. So I'm reading this book right now called uh, My Own Devices. It's a memoir by a woman named Dessa. She's a musician, a hip hop artist. She used to perform, maybe still does, with a group called Doom Tree out of Minneapolis. But she also has a solar career and is amazing. My favorite song that she's ever written is called Fire Drills. And I'm going to read a few of the lyrics to you, if you don't mind. So listen, pay attention. It's not the whole song. I'm not going to start from the very top. And I just want to note that um, I was remembering today that in 2016, um, I shared a few lyrics from uh, Prince the day after he died. So we're just continuing this, this theme, and who knows what will happen next year. Um, you can't be too broke to break as a woman always something left to take, so you shouldn't try to stay too late or talk to strangers, look too long, go too far out of range, because angels can't watch everybody all the time. Stay close, hems low, safe inside. That formula works if you can live it, but it works by putting half the world off limits. We don't say go out and be brave. Now nah, we say be careful, stay safe. In any given instance, that don't hurt, but it sinks in like stilettos in soft earth. Like the big win is not a day without an incident. I beg to differ with it. I think a woman's worth, I think that she deserves a better line of work than MFing vigilance. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Don't give me vigilance. By definition, you can't make a difference if the big ambition is simply standing sentry to your innocence. That's not a way to live. That can't be what a woman is. That gives her nothing to aspire to. What that is, what that is, is just a life of running fire drills. So Chair Kafori, I want to thank you for not being careful and for not just staying safe, but rather for going out and being brave. This county is better for it. Thank you so much. Although the part of that stuck out to me was the day without incidents. I actually would like one. Just one. <laughs> one day, please. I can appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> All right, Marina, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The resolution's adopted. Thank you both. Thank you all. Not done yet. We will now adjourn as the Multnomah County Library District and reconvene as the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. R10, authorizing salary adjustments for employees not covered by collective bargaining agreements for fiscal year 2022 through 2023. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds. Approval of R10. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, for the record, Susan Mullett, Classification and Compensation Manager in Central Human Resources. I'm here on behalf of Shelley Kent, the Interim Chief Human Resources Officer. Um, I'm asking the board to approve the non-represented pay scale and compensation ranges for all managers and non-represented employees. This year, it includes a 5% cost of living adjustment, COLA. Um, currently, the Human Resources Labor Relations Team is bargaining with a number of our unions, and at the end of the bargaining, that will determine their COLA for them. Um, are there any questions? I think mine's pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Marina, did we receive any public testimony? No, Madam Chair. All right, questions or comments? Commissioner Myron? None. Commissioner Jayapal? No questions. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman? No questions, thank you. Thank you so much, no questions for me either, so we will have a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye, the resolution's adopted. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have time for board comments on any non-agenda items or really anything that you wanna talk about. Uh, Commissioner Jayapal, how about you? 
Well, this feels a little anticlimactic, but... <laughs> <laughs> You're going to an event this weekend? <laughs> I'm going to an event this weekend. <laughs> there are a lot of events this weekend. Um, there's obviously the Pride Festival, Pride Parade, um, but the one that I wanted to mention is a new one. It's called the Freedom Festival, and it is the first black book festival so in celebration of Juneteenth, and it's happening on Saturday at Peninsula Park from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. So I will be there and look forward to seeing anyone who wants to join me. Thank you, Commissioner Vicki Peterson. Thank you, Chair. So just congratulations, everyone, again, on the budget. Um, this is a big achievement, biggest budget ever. Um, I also, there are a lot of events and activities with um, Pride and Juneteenth and Father's Day. So, you know, hopefully everybody gets a chance to get out there. Um, one thing I did want to mention is that, um, is, is something that I just wanted to share with the board. Um, you know, as um, all of you know, in 2012, the city of Portland was sued by the Department of Justice for its handling of police interactions with those suffering from behavioral health issues. And while the lawsuit was settled, the city remained under supervision and the settlement has been reopened as a result of PPB's ongoing use of force. Data indicates that the use of force against those suffering from behavioral health issues has increased since 2017, and the type of force has also intensified. The Mental Health Alliance is pursuing requirements and investments as part of any new settlement that will reduce interactions between PPB and those with behavioral health issues. I believe that Multnomah County has an interest in this topic and ideas for how we can reduce interactions between law enforcement and those suffering from behavioral health issues. Um, my office has discussed with each of your offices sending a letter regarding the DOJ PPB settlement, and um, we'd like your offices to weigh in and consider signing on. Um, so we'll have more details around this and to share soon as well as a letter for consideration, and you can always reach out to my office with any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman. I don't have anything. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <coughs> Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Um, I just... Uh, one thing that I, uh, in regard to the uh, DOJ settlement and the letter mentioned by Commissioner Vega Peterson, I was on, I served on um, the original COAB, which was overseeing that settlement uh, work with the, um, with the community, and uh, there is so much there. They learned a lot from missteps in how they administered the first group, but um, continue to be involved in that process. So I would love to uh, engage in that with you and um, and look forward to seeing the letter. And then also uh, shared some information with you but can share to other people here that there is, um, we've all hear, heard of the Built for Zero movement and we had a presentation on it from the Joint Office of S Homeless Services uh, and there um, has been a lot of conflicting information that's been circulating around the initiative, uh, including what constitutes sort of the, quote, by name list, uh, unquote, which is associated with it. And the um, built, there's a presentation being co-hosted by the Interfaith Alliance on Poverty Here Together and Shelter Now that is featuring the um, president and CEO of Community Solutions, which is the sponsor of Built for Zero. It's gonna be a hybrid uh, presentation. It is tomorrow, uh, 8.30 to 9.30. Uh, there's an opportunity to join by Zoom, or it is at the Westminster Presbyterian Great Hall, 1624 Northeast Hancock. And um, you can contact my office. We'll have information about it on my website if you are interested in attending. And I think it it will be um, very informational. So I believe that's it. Thanks. That's it. Budget day 2023 is over. Yay. <laughs> we have nothing else for today, but we will be back here Tuesday, June 24th, June 21st at 10 a.m. for our budget briefing. All right, see you then.